let's kick it off. Uh, welcome to our first Tableau Zen Master webinar in 2017. Uh, today, uh, Andy Kriebel is going to run us through his top 20, maybe more, tips using Tableau Desktop. Um, currently on the screen, you hopefully see a, a nice little picture from uh, last week's uh, Tableau conference in Las Vegas, and you see a massive crowd of fans <laughs> and Tableau users from all around the world. Uh, there were uh, actually 15,000 um, attendees at Tableau conference uh, uh, last week, so very successful and a, a really great event. Um, I think most of you will already know the Information Lab. Someone is not on mute, I hope. Deal with that. We'll try to unmute everyone. So please, everyone, put yourself on mute where possible. All right. Right. Most of you no information lab i think from the tableau community online through uh, tableau zen masters like andy kriebel uh, craig bloodworth or chris love from the information lab uh, the information lab is gold partner of, of tableau has been for years uh, we are also tableau partner of the year in emea and across various countries in europe and as you can see on this slide uh, we have locations in eight European countries, which are UK, Ireland, Germany, Netherlands, Italy, France, Luxembourg, and Poland. We have a great team of more than 100 uh, consultants, which are all certified um, by Tableau. Uh, some of them, well, around 30 of them are also certified trainers for, for Tableau. So we are catering for many, many companies, many, many customers uh, across Europe in, in different industries um, and different departments and, and uh, help those, uh, those teams working with Tableau, creating uh, data visualizations on the fly, sharing them with Tableau Server in a, in a bigger organization. Um, and we train teams to get up to speed with Tableau uh, very fast. Um, we have some very important uh, services lined up for you as a customer, which are, for instance, our, our support desk, multilingual, uh, which you won't get anywhere else. And we have our own um, community for customers called the Center of Excellence, where we actually have around 1,500 um, customer, uh, customers lined up who can communicate via mobile on, in the browser, uh, raise questions in regards to how to use Tableau in, a, in, a, in an organization, etc. So that has been very, very convenient for our customers. Um, as mentioned, we are running training and consultancy in regards to Tableau, but not only Tableau, also Altrix software, um, which is uh, a, a software tool, very powerful software tool, uh, an ETL uh, um, in, in, in spatial and predictive analytics. And well, we are also catering for the community, as you can see here. So we are running free Zen Master webinars uh, uh, to others following in, during this year, and uh, where you can sign up. In, no, in November, it will be Chris Love, and in December, it will be uh, Craig Bloodworth running the show. We have Andy Kriebel on the line, who is uh, not only a Tableau Zen master and an extremely experienced uh, Tableau user, but also um, the uh, head of our own data school in London. Uh, this has been established three years ago, and yeah, applications welcome. So if you want to join, or if you know someone who wants to join, you can visit uh, the website of the data school at www.thedataschool. .co.uk. Um, yeah, I think let's give it a go. And I will pass over, um, before I do that, I will uh, ask you one little question which you uh, hopefully can quickly uh, answer how you actually got aware of this webinar. So I hope you can see, yeah, you, you're already starting to vote, which is excellent. I will wait, let's say, 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
it's a race. I like watching the numbers go up and down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hi, Andy, by the way. Hello. So maybe you can, well, you can you can start introducing yourself, and uh, then I will pass over the screen to you so you can share your Tableau desktop then. Sure. Yeah. So hi, everybody. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Andy Kriebel, and I am the head coach of the Information Labs Data School. Um, here, in, here based in London. Formerly, I ran data visualization in the Tableau practice at Facebook, and I was the first ever Tableau user at Coca-Cola. Um, started using Tableau on April 11th of 2007, uh, so it's a very important anniversary to me. Um, so today, uh, while we've let people finish the poll here, uh, what I'll be doing, it looks like the poll has slowed down here, so I think we might be okay. Maybe we can bring it up again at the end to see if um, if uh, if anybody else needs to vote. Okay, do you want to close the poll? So you should be you should be having control now, and I will then. Stop yeah, I am. The I am not vote. present. I think you need to make me presenter. I am not presenter. Okay, let me quickly check. I'm not able to show my screen. I think I'll close the poll as well. Okay, there we go. I got it. Okay, I'm good now. <clears throat> okay, so can you see my screen now, Dirk? Yes, I do. Okay, great. So um, as Dirk mentioned, I'm the head coach of the Information Labs Data School. And here's the URL if you're interested in applying or you know anybody that wants to apply. Um, have them go to www.thedataschool.co.uk. All of the information you need is on there. We've got a really cool video about the, uh, about the program and things about who the teachers are and where we're located and the curriculum. And the most important thing probably is actually the blog. So this week in particular, the team is, um, we have nine people in the seventh cohort of the data school and they're each writing a tip a day. So by the end of this week, there's gonna be 40 new tips, uh, both Alteryx and Tableau most likely um, out there for you to read. So I would encourage you to subscribe in whatever uh, blog reader you use to that. Um, my website is bizwiz.com, so www.bizwiz.com. So I write a lot of stuff on here about uh, all different kinds of things. Um, in particular, uh, every Monday, I run a project called Makeover Monday with Eva Murray, uh, and that's makeovermonday.co.uk. And on this website, you can find uh, all of the past data sets that we have, uh, that we have that we have published, so back to 2016. So that right now there's uh, 52, uh, 94 data sets for you out here to practice with. Um, everything is prepared for you. All you have to do is download the data and get visiting. Um, so uh, it's a great project. We had over 500 people attend the Makeover Monday live session at the Tableau conference, and another 200 got turned away outside, which uh, it just absolutely blows my mind. We had we had 100 last year, and for to see it grow fivefold is is pretty amazing. And uh, on Wednesdays, I run a project called Workout Wednesday with Emma White. So if you go to my blog and then go to the Workout Wednesday page, um, it looks like I need to update this because I forgot to put week 41 up there. But basically, um, this is kind of like a weekly challenge, a weekly Tableau challenge. Uh, so I run this with Emma White, who runs the Center of Excellence at the Data School. Um, and then Thursdays, I write on my other blog, uh, datavizdoneright.com, where I highlight visualizations that I see around the web and what I like about them. So this is a great place for you to get inspiration from, from great visualizations around the web. So, but that's not why you're here. You are here to see my tips. So when Dirk and I first started talking about this, um, we were talking about maybe me doing my 20 favorite tips. And uh, when we chatted yesterday, I kind of came to the conclusion that I don't think I can share just 20. Um, I don't I don't know what my 20, fa it might take me a month to figure out what my 20 favorite tips are. So what I thought I would do is, um, I hopefully many of you have, were not at the Tableau conference. Well, hopefully we're at the Tableau conference, but um, if you missed my session with Jeff Schaefer, uh, we did a Tableau speed tipping session. And the idea for that was to see how many tips we could share in 50 minutes. Um, he did beat me by three. I believe the final score was, uh, uh, gosh, I don't remember what the final score was now, 36 to 33, something like that. I think we got to 79 tips in 50 minutes. And what I'm going to do today is I only, actually only made it through about 20 of my, my slides here. So I'm going to actually take you through the ones that I showed at the conference, as well as 
all of the ones that I did not get to. Um, I will slow down. Um, I'll do my best to slow down. If I'm going too fast, um, just say something or Dirk can message me if he thinks I'm going too fast, um, which I'm sure he'll do. So why don't we go ahead and get started. You ready, Dirk? Let's get okay. it off. All right, great. So um, the first thing that I want to do here is to show you how you can uh, make the region field a geographic field. So you notice here we've got region and it just is comes into Tableau as a text field because when I right click on a um, on a field, if I go down to the geographic role, I don't see region as a field here, right? So I don't I don't see region anywhere. So um, what I can do is if I go ahead and choose states and maybe let's just look at let's say something like profit ratio. And I can filter by state, right? So I can quickly filter by state and, and choose it. But what I can't do is actually have this all as a big blob for the West, in other words, and this one as a big block for the South. So how can we overcome that? So I'm going to first take region back off. Um, what I can do is I can actually right click on the region field. And I know that region is composed of a bunch of states. So there's a block of states that represent a region. So there's a, an implicit hierarchy there. So when I click on the region field, I can go down to geographic role and go down to create from, and I can create my geographic role for region from the state field. And you'll notice how Tableau gives me a hierarchy aut automatically. So now if I just take region and replace state with region, I get a map of profit ratio by region. So this tip came to me from Heidi from the information lab in Germany. So she was here uh, training with us in her very first week. And um, I love it when people that are brand new to Tableau show me tips that I'd never seen, even though I've been using the software for 10 years. So again, the easy way to do that is to right click on the region field, go down to geographic role, create from, and you pick the, uh, the uh, hierarchy that you would like to build your geographic role. From. Okay, so that's the first one. So now, um, what I want to do for this particular example here is I want to be able to show uh, the temperature change for all years within a month. So what do I mean by that? Okay, well first let me go ahead and change this to monthly level. And then let me go ahead and bring the year field onto detail. And we see we've got a line for every year. Basically what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to look at all of these Januaries at the same time and sort of see the spread. It's a bit tough with all of these lines. So there's a hidden function in Tableau called random. So I'm going to just double click in my column shelf and I'm going to type in random, open and close brackets. And if I just hit enter, you now see I get a nice jittered view. So basically what Tableau does is it spreads all of the dots out between zero and one. Very, very simple. So from here, I could just quickly change these to circles and I get a nice pretty view like that. So now I can see the distribution a bit better than I could with all of the lines. So again, that's just a little hidden function. Um, if you go into, if I go into create a calculated field, you won't see random listed anywhere on this left-hand side. See, random is not there. It's one of those hidden functions that you have to know about, uh, that you have to see like this in order to know about it. So that's a great way to show the, dis the distribution of all the temperatures um, of all the years within each month. So we could take that to another level though. So now that I've got uh, that same view, what I want to do is I want to show a box plot, but all I want to emphasize is the outliers. So in other words, if, I, if you can picture a box plot being drawn on here, you know, if you get your box with your whiskers, I may want to just see maybe these outliers. So how can we do that? So first I'm going to go over to the analytics pane. I'm just going to drag on a box plot onto my median. Okay, and we get something like that. So essentially what I want to do is I want to be able to see these dots up here, right? These ones that are outside of my whiskers. I want to be able to see just those. I still want to see my box, but I want to hide everything else behind it. So how can I do that? Well, if I go back into my box plot settings, there's this little option here that most people don't even notice. It's called hide underlying marks. And I don't know if you noticed it, but look what happens in the background. Let me let me uncheck that box and we get the and we get all you can see all the dots in the background. Check that box again, and there you go. Hit OK. And now all we see is our outliers. So we can see we've got one cold outlier here in uh, 1862. And then we have a lot of other ones. So 2015, 2015, 2015. You see a lot of these years are recent. So a lot of the, the extreme temperatures are within the most recent couple of years. 
So that's a really, really quick way to show outliers behind a box plot or to uh, hide the, um, uh, to only emphasize the outliers in a box plot. Okay, so next up, um, so you'll see I've got two fields here. One is a year field and one is a date field, or I'm sorry, one is a month field. So month is a number. So if I, let me just go ahead and do a new sheet real quick. I'll just do a new sheet. And you can see I've got, I've got years, which is just a number. And I have month, which is just a number. A lot of times your data will come in like this. You'll have multiple columns, maybe one for year, one for month, and one for day. And you need to build up a date field. So how would you go about doing that? Well, I'm gonna go ahead and delete this sheet. So you can see I've got this view here where I have year and month fields, but how can I convert those to a date? So I've got 1850 and I have months one through 12 going left to right. Really what I wanna do is I wanna take these two fields and make them into a date. So to do that, I'm gonna create a calculated field. I'm gonna call it my, um, I'll call it my temperature date. Oops, if I could spell correctly. Always pressure to type correctly. So there is a little make date function here. So actually, let me search for it on the left-hand side. Oops, be a bit easier so we can bring up the help. So within Tableau, there's a make date function. And what this function does is you can pass into it an integer for the year, an integer for the month, and an integer, an integer for the day, and it'll automatically calculate the year for you, or the, the date for you. So I'm just gonna double click on make date. And then I'm just going to drag in my year field, do a comma, drag in my month field. And I don't have a day field. Well, it doesn't really matter what number I put in here for the day because it's I'm rolling up to the monthly level anyway. So I'm just going to stick a one in there. But if you did have a day field, you could put that in there as well. So again, uh, you're just passing in three integers here. So um, if, you, if your months were the names of the months, then this particular function would not work, but a lot of times you get the month as a number instead. So let me just hit OK, and now I can take this field off, and I have my temperature date, and I can stick that on there, maybe make this entire view, and then now I have all of the date functions that I'm familiar with. So nice and neat. OK, so next. Um, when you read CSVs, a lot of times what you'll see is uh, Tableau will read uh, fields in as text. So for example, if I look down here at my unit price field here, you'll see that Tableau has read this field in as a string. Now that could be because there's um, a space in there or there's, um, you know, there's a multiple number of reasons why that could be. But if I want to make that, I know that unit price should actually be a number. And it should also be a measure. So it should be down here in my measures list. So how can I fix that real quickly? So all you need to do is you need to just click on the little ABC button and I'm just gonna make it a decimal. And there we go. So you see what happened in my view here. So Tableau automatically kind of truncated that. So if I undo and then I redo, you'll see that I get kind of the, the Tableau's rounding it to two decimals. That's just the default number format. But if I wanna make it a measure, all I need to do is just drag it down to my measures. And there we go. So now I can look at, you know, maybe, maybe I want to set my default number, my default aggregation to an average because I want to look at the average price. And if I drag that into the view, I'll see my average price is 89.35. And I can maybe look at it over time and see how my uh, average price is changing over time. Something like that. Very, very simple. So if your data is ever the wrong type, you can just click on these little, uh, the little icon on the left, uh, to the left of the, uh, the name of the field, and you can quickly change it there. The alternative to that is to right click on the field and go to change data type, and you get the same menu. So it's just personal preference. Okay, so in this particular example, um, I've created a scatter plot, and you'll see that it has 163 nulls. So um, I think most people, what they do is when they see this indicator, they right click on it and they choose to hide that indicator because it's a bit annoying to see that, right? Who wants to see that little null indicator? Now Tableau puts that there just to make you aware of, uh, of all of the nulls that it's found. But um, let's say, for example, so let me undo that. Again, I can right click on that field and hide the indicator. But let's say that for some reason I need to get that back. So uh, you know, if, I, if I'm, you know, uh, come back to this workbook tomorrow, I can't hit undo to bring that back. So to bring back that null indicator, 
you want to go up to the analysis menu, go down to special values, and choose show. And there you go. That brings that back. So again, I can hide the indicator. If I want to bring it back, I can go up to analysis. Muted. Unmuted. Okay, I think I am. Can you hear me again now, Dirk? I think you muted me by accident. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, accident. okay great. <laughs> okay, so again, uh, I'm going to hide the indicator, go up to the analysis menu, special values, and you get to show to bring it back. Okay, so if somebody is, uh, is not on mute on the phone, can you please mute yourselves? Thank you. Okay. So the next thing I want to do is uh, a lot of times you'll have a scatter plot. And this, in this particular example, I'm looking at 2014 versus 2015 sales. And what I want to do is I want to draw a perfect 45 degree reference line, uh, 45 degree uh, line through this visualization. So how can we go about doing that? Well, it's actually pretty simple. I'm going to just duplicate my 2014 sales field down to my rows. And you'll see I now have this series of dots going across here, right? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually make this one a dual axis. Right click on my secondary axis and synchronize just to make sure everything is okay. And now I just need to do a bit of cleanup. So I'm, first I'm going to go to my all marks card and I'm going to remove measure names from the color shelf in order to get rid of uh, the, the color discrepancies. And now I've got two additional shelves, one for 2015 sales and one for 2014 sales. So on the 2014 sales shelf, I want to actually change this to, uh, let me just change it to a line. It doesn't really matter. And you see I get a line here. It doesn't really matter how I do it uh, because I'm going to actually make these transparent anyway, and I'm going to make them super small. I, basically, I'm trying to reduce the chances of somebody um, uh, accidentally clicking on one of these dots because, yeah, I can hover over it and see it, but I'm, I'm trying to sort of make that transparent to the user. So now if I go to my analytics pane, I can take a trend line, and if I put a linear trend line on 2014 sales, you say I get a perfect 45-degree um, angle on my visualization. So now I'm going to go actually hide the header on my secondary axis, and now I can easily see which ones are above or below. The next step then might be to compare 2014 sales to 2015 sales. So I think, let's see if I have that. Okay, so I think this change field... So this is looking at my, uh, actually, why don't I just create a new calculated field? So I'm going to call this 2015 increase. Can, can somebody please mute themselves? It's very distracting. Whoever's walking around, please mute yourself. So in this case, what I want to look at is I want to say the sum of 2015 sales. Oops. Ah, sales 2015 is bigger than the sales, oops the sum of sales 2014. Okay, there we go. So this is going to re result in a Boolean, just a yes or no. Are you above? Is 2015 bigger than 2014? Okay, so now I need to remember what I just called that. Uh, I think I called it 2015 increase. And if I put that, if I go to my uh, 2015 shelf and I put that on color, I can now easily see which ones are above or below. So very, very simple there. So a couple things there. Again, for the 45 degree reference line, just duplicate one of your fields onto the other shelf and then make the dot small and then just throw a trend line on and you're all set. Okay, this next tip comes from Rachel Fang. Uh, she showed me this while she was in the data school. She was in our sixth cohort. And what she was trying to show here is how can I create a bar chart without an axis? So typically what we would do is we would maybe put uh, let's put uh, you know product subcategory there, and we look at 2014 sales, and we would we would uh, sort that. But notice how we have a an axis here, right? So we would typically just go ahead and uncheck the show header, but the axis is still there because we can see we've got 2014 sales on the column shelf. So how can we get around that? Okay, so let me just go back. So I've got 2014, I'm sorry, I've got my product subcategory on my rows. If I just take my 2014 sales and I put that on the size shelf, you'll see I get this little, uh, I get uh, my, my uh, side shelf card, size shelf card over there. But if I change my mark type to a bar, I now get a nice little bar chart. And if I make it fit higher view, I now have a no axis bar chart. 
So really, really cool. I, I, I really like this one. So notice there's nothing on my column shelf and I still have a nice little bar chart. So there we go. So very cool. Okay, so this, this next one uh, comes from Natasha, who was also in the data school. Um, so in this particular example, I'm gonna go ahead and throw this in presentation mode real quick. And you can see, you know, typically, let's say this is a mobile view and we have some kind of filtering on here, right? So we've got basic filtering where they can click on a state and it filters the rest of the view. But what I want is um, I don't want the user to be able to click on anything, right? So I could turn off all actions, but I don't want them to be able to touch anything at all. I don't even want them to be able to hover. So how can I do that? So to do that, I'm going to go ahead and um, I'm going to switch my object type to floating. And I'm going to drag a blank object over top of this view here. And now if I just drag this blank object over top of my dashboard, and I go back into presentation mode, notice how I can't click on anything. So if you don't want people to click on things, just drag a blank object, and basically you're putting a surface in front of the dashboard. So a very, very neat way to make things unclickable. Okay, it looks like we still have some background noise. So somebody, I'm gonna actually go into the attendees here and mute everybody again. It's quite distracting when people do this. Okay, Dirk, you can still hear me? Hopefully. Okay. So yes, some... I do. Yeah. Okay. Oh, great. Okay. So um, the next thing is, uh, so sometimes what will happen is somebody will send you a TWBX, right? So this is just a packaged workbook. And what Tableau does is when it packages up the workbook, it, it packages up the Tableau workbook along with all of the data. But my question here is somebody sent me this workbook, but I need the original data. How can I get it just from the TWBX? Well, it's actually quite simple. So on a, on a PC, you would just use WinZip, but on a Mac, um, I use a tool called the Unarchiver. So I'm going to choose to open with, and I go to other. And if I go down to all applications, and let me sort this so I can find it quickly. I use one called the Unarchiver. It's the same thing. It just unzips files and hit open. What you'll see here is now it's actually Tableau's unzipped that workbook. So if I scroll down here and I go into data, I can see that there's actually two data files inside of this workbook. One is Superstore and one is share prices within the banking industry. And then lastly is the Tableau workbook that it came with. So really cool that you can, uh, you can unzip a workbook and get the original data. All right. So in this particular example, what I want to do is, uh, let's say that I've got, uh, I'm going to put year up here in the columns, and I'm going to put median in the rows, and uh, let's make this continuous. Okay, and now what we can see is we have, um, you know, we've got our, uh, our basic line chart here of the median temperature by year. So what I want to be able to do now is, um, notice how I've got kind of these big gaps here. So if I zoom in here, I've got kind of this big space here. I want, I want this 1960 to be closer to the left-hand side, right? So I could double click on my axis and maybe change it to 1959 and go through, this looks like it goes through 20, so maybe I make this 2018, something like that. And I can do it like that. But if I want to be more precise without having to manually change the, the, um, uh, the, the number, what I can do is over here on my year field, so remember before where we were able to change unit price from a text to a number, I can actually change my year from a whole number to a decimal. And watch what happens there. So you, you might not have seen it, but it gets very, very slightly moves over to the left. So now when I go back into my edit axis, I've got precise control. So I could say, you know what, I want you to start at uh, one, uh, 1959.5 and I want it to end at 2016.5, so a half a year on either end. And now I've got much more precise control over my axis simply by changing it from a number, whole number, to a decimal number. So it's not changing the value. So uh, if you, if sometimes when you'll display the tooltip here, you'll see that it would say, for example, 1968.0. So what I like to do in this case is I'll right click on my field, go down to my default properties, 
and change my default number format. So you'll see it's, I've already set it to custom uh, uh, of zero decimals. So that's a good way to um, make sure that your numbers display the way that you want. Okay, so this uh, next tip comes from um, Stephanie Kearns, who's actually in the data school now. So she showed me this one. She said, she said yesterday it was an accident that she showed me this, but I'll show it anyway. Um, so first off, let me walk you through kind of the example here. So if I click on the label shelf, and I, let's say I want to label the ends of the lines. So I can go onto the label shelf and choose my line ends, choose to show my mark labels, right? So I get something like that, and I've got the ends of the lines. Now, but what I want is I want it to look more like, so if I choose the most recent option, notice how I now have a nice little dot on the end of the line, right? So if I go in here, you'll see I've got this nice little dot on the end of the line. But when I go back to my line ends, that little dot disappears. Personally, I just kind of like the look of those little dots. So previously, what I would have done was I would have gone ahead and created a new calculated field to actually take care of that. So what I would have done before, I'm going to call this dot ends. And I would have done something like if it's the first value, so if first equals zero or last equals zero, oops, then give me the median of, nope, I need to do the median of the median. If I could spell, that would help. And get out there. And then end, right? So this is saying basically if I'm at the first point or the last point, give me the median. Otherwise, don't give me anything. And what I would do before is I would go ahead and put that on the uh, view and then do a dual axis, something like that, right? And then synchronize. And I'm going to actually go to my first marks card and turn these labels off. There we go. And again, what I would do is I would, I would change my default number format to start out with a custom number. So I think we were doing one decimal place. And notice how my negatives have a minus in front, right? So if I just hit OK here, you'll see my, uh, this doesn't have a minus on it. So what I want to be able to do is, and this one doesn't have a plus. So notice on my scale here, I've got, it, goes, it always shows the minus and the plus sign. So what I'm going to do for that is go to my default properties, go back to my default properties, my number format. And once I set up the, cu the uh, number custom, I'm going to go down here to the custom option. And notice how what Tableau does is it sticks a negative on the negative part. And I'm just going to stick a plus in front of the positive part and hit OK. And now I've got these numbers. OK, so to clean this up, what I would have done before is I would have taken measure names off. And now I've got my little dots on the end, right? That's quite a bit of work. So what's the way around that? So let me take dot ends off. And the, really the, the super fast way to do this now is to actually show the mark labels. And then on the, uh, instead of showing line ends, do the min and the max, right? So when I do the min and the max, I now have this option called field. I want to do the min and the max based on my date. So my year of date. And there we go. So, but you see how it's put the year label on there. So all I need to do is just copy my median down to my label. And now I've got my nice little um, uh, labels on the ends of my lines plus the little dots. So again, all you have to do is go to the label shelf, pick the min max option, and then use this field section, which I had never even knew was there. So super, super handy tip. All right. So, um, when you are building a visualization, let's say we want to combine these two axes, right, 2014 and 2015. Typically what I would have done in the past is I would have taken this field and dragged it onto the top, of the sh on, onto the top here so that we get the two green rulers. So these two green rulers give you a combined axis and we get something like that, right? But there's another way you can do it. So when you hover over any field, that's in the view, you'll notice you get this little triangle in the corner. So here we've got a triangle, and then up here we've got a blue triangle because it's a discrete field. For the continuous fields, you get a green triangle. So if you want to move these fields around, all you have to do is, is get the little cross over top of that corner. So you see my cursor turned into a cross, and now I can drag that wherever I want. So I can drag it there, or I could go up here, and then maybe I want to drag it over here, 
uh, or maybe I want to put it on color, something like that. Um, or I can take it and maybe put it up here. So you can drag these fields wherever you want just by using the cross. So just personal preference there. And this tip came from um, Andre and the Information Lab Germany. Okay. In this particular example, what I want to be able to do is um, if I, let me just go ahead and, and format this a bit and get rid of my, uh, my row dividers. Okay, so I've got nice clean, uh, a nice clean look now, right? There's no lines and anything. But what I want to be able to do is put a space between kind of the west and the central here because these look like they just kind of run together, right? I'd like to have some sort of break in there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my analytics pane and I'm going to drag on a subtotal. And notice now everything rescaled based on the totals, right? So essentially this is kind of the row that I want to use as my spacer. So what I'm going to do is when I hover over, when I click on the total and I go to automatic, oops, sorry, wrong spot. If I click on one of the bars and then choose this automatic menu, I can just choose hide. And that actually hides all of my subtotals. And now if I format the label for my total, I could just get rid of that, make it blank. And now I've got a nice little gap in my reports, nice and neat. So now when I go in the presentation mode, it looks much cleaner than it did before. And you can see the natural breaks in the view. If you need to put spaces between, so this is a similar example, but in this case, I want to put spaces kind of between these columns because there's so much on here, it feels like they're all running together. So what I want to do is I want to put gaps in between these columns. So to do that, I'm just going to create a, cal I'm just going to double click on my shelf and do an in-shelf calculation. And I'm just going to call it int of null. That's it. So basically I'm creating a space. So you see, I got this blank card here on the, or this blank space on the right hand side. And now I can move that in between these two, or I could duplicate it and put it between those two and duplicate it again. And now I've got some nice spacing in between each of these. So what I would do at this point is, um, you know, the, these kind of headers down here are pretty ugly. So what I would do here is double click on the axis, get rid of the title and then get rid of the marks. So go to my tick marks and choose none. And there we go. So now I've got these nice little blank spaces here. So again, go to tick marks and choose none. And one more time, double click on my axis, get rid of the title, go to tick marks, set it to none, and hit OK. So now we've got nice little spacing between, the, between each of the columns, and it looks a bit cleaner. All right, so the next thing I want to do is I want to be able to create a uh, population pyramid or a bikini chart, some people call it, because it kind of looks like a bikini sometimes. So I'm going to start by just putting year onto the rows. And then from here, I'm going to take my male population, put that in the columns, and let's pick a single country, actually. Right, we could do world population, doesn't matter. And now I have my females as well, so I'm going to drop that on top of this axis and make it um, dual, uh, make it a combined axis. And then I'm going to take measure names and put that on the color shelf. Okay, so now we've got both males and females, right? But you see how they're stacked up. I want the females to go to the left and I want the males to go to the right. So how can I change that? Well, it's actually pretty simple. I'm just going to double click in this, uh, in my, on my measure value shelf on the sum of females. And I'm just going to stick a minus sign in the front. And there we go. We now have a beautiful little, oops, sorry, I went to the wrong spot. We now have a beautiful little population pyramid. So I can make this an area chart. And now we have something really clean and maybe make my year continuous. But notice when I take make my year continuous, it flips the axis. So I just need to go into my axis and reverse it. But notice here how my numbers say minus 3.5 million, right? That's not really what I want. I want that to be displayed as a positive number. So how can I fix that? Well, that's actually pretty easy as well. So I'm going to right click on the axis and choose format. And here under my scale, I can choose my numbers. And again, I'll start with the number custom. And notice how this is changing down here. You'll just watch the axis. So when I reduce it to zero decimals, that's great. And then my units I want in millions. Okay, now it looks like it did a minute ago, but that's not quite what we want. 
So what I'm going to do now is go to my custom option. And all I'm going to do is, in, in on the negative part of this expression, so notice how Tableau separates the positive and the negatives with the semicolon. On the negative part, I'm going to just remove that minus sign. And now they all look like positive numbers in both directions. So a really, really easy way to create a population uh, population pyramid. Okay, so in this next example, what I want to be able to do is when I click on a state, um, I want to be able to, um, when I click on this state, notice how everything changes down here in the bottom. But what I want is I want this map to, um, to zoom into just that state. So in other words, if I click Montana, I should see just Montana. If I click on Texas, this whole map should reset to just Texas. So to do that, I'm going to go ahead and put a worksheet action onto the view. So I'm going to go up to Worksheet Actions, and I'm going to add an action. Actually, I'll do it through a dashboard action because we're in a dashboard. So Dashboard Actions. And what I want to do is I want to add a filter action. And I'm going to go from the map. So this is the dashboard symbol here. But my target sheet here is going to be my map. So I have to hopefully find my map, which I believe is this one. And um, I want to do it on select. But now I need to pick the selected fields. So what I want to start off with is my state. And, I'm, that, and my target is going to be my state. Hit OK again. Hit OK one last time to get out of my action window. And now when I click on Montana, it zooms to Montana. If I click on Kansas, it zooms to Kansas. If I lasso multiple states, it'll zoom into just those states. So again, the way to do that is a dashboard action. But the trick for this action is on the, on the target part is to pick a sheet and not the dashboard. So in this second section, make sure you pick the sheet that you want it to apply to. OK, so now in this particular example, um, I'm going to quickly build a map that, of all of the, uh, the bus routes on in, in London. So um, you can see I've got a, a simple map of the UK. And I want to put uh, each route on the detail. And I get some kind of mess like this because Tableau doesn't really know how to connect, play the game of connect the dots. So I have this sequence field, which basically tells me the order of the bus stops. So I'm going to put that on the path shelf. And now we have a nice little uh, map of all of the um, all of the, uh, the the buses in London. But what I want to be able to do is, um, if they pick, for example, only ten bus routes, so maybe just the first ten, I want these lines to be thicker when I pick less routes. So to do that, I've created a calculation called size, and what this calculation is saying is, it's looking at the total number of routes that are in the view. And if it's bigger than 10, then assign it the value of 1. Otherwise, assign it the value of 10. So again, this total function is just counting. The, it's, it's kind of think of this as the grand total. So what's the grand total of the number of roots in the view? If that's bigger than 10, then make them size 1. If it's um, otherwise, give me a size 10. OK, so let's take that size and put that on. I called it size so I would know what shelf to put it on. And I get this nice fat view here. Um, so now what I need to do is just double click on my size shelf. And I'm going to make this a range. And I'm going to force it to go from 1 to 10, because that's what I know the scale that I want. And maybe I'll make my smaller one slightly smaller. Hit Apply. OK, so now, because I have all roots in the view, you'll see I get these really thin lines. So let me go back. And now if I just pick 1 through 10, I get nice thick lines, or if I go 9 or 8 or whatever, back to all. Or if I pick 15 of them, so let me uncheck. If I pick 15 of them, they should all be thin because I've gone back to I have more than 10. So a really neat way to be able to resize marks uh, in a view based on the number of items in the view. Migration. OK. Uh, somebody is not on mute. Can you mute yourselves, please, those of you that are talking and not paying attention? Andy, maybe click on mute all again and yeah. then unmute yourself. Yeah, it's really annoying. I'm not sure why people join the webinar if they're not going to listen. Um, OK. So 
in this particular example, uh, what I want to be able to do is, so I've got a continuous axis down here, and you'll see it says has month, uh, has the month and year because I've chosen the month year option here, my continuous months. But what I want to be able to do is just show that as a single letter. So to do that, I'm going to right click on my axis and choose format. And down here on my axis uh, shelf, I can go down here to my dates. And if I pick different options here, you'll see, watch the axis change as I pick different <coughs> options, right? But if I go down to custom, what I can do now is I can just start typing in anything I want. So if I just put in an M, that gives me the month number. Uh, MM gives me the month number as two decimals. MMM gives me the short name for the month or the abbreviation. MMMM gives me the full name of the month. And if I add one more, I now get a single letter for the month. So this is now showing me each um, a single letter month on a continuous axis. If I want to add the year on there, I could just do maybe YY with maybe an apostrophe before it. So that would give me the month and the year as a single letter. So this, this custom formatting is quite powerful uh, for dates. All right, so in this particular example, what I want to be able to do is, uh, let's say I also put my region onto my label shelf. And notice how, and I'll go ahead and uh, I like to make my marks match the mark color. So notice how central, for example, is kind of overlapping a bit. And I'm particularly like that. So I need to actually make a bit of space here on the end. So how can I do that? Well, there's a couple ways. First off, um, I like to use, uh, some people will go in here and just change the end, right? Uh, but that's not really a very um, elegant way to do it because then you see the little pin on the axis. So I could start by just putting a constant line on here and just saying, you know, if I want to put 2018 or something like that, right? And that didn't work because it didn't save my date. So let me edit that again. Ah, so let's make this 2018. Okay. And now you see I've got plenty of space at the end and I've got this little kind of hidden reference line here. All right. So that's not quite what I want. So I'm going to actually remove that reference line. I want this to be more dynamic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a calculated field and I'm going to call it my max month. And I'm just going to use a simple level of detail expression. So I'm going to stick in my two mustachios that define the start and end of my, um, my level of detail expression. I'm going to do the max. And I'm going to actually just drag my month into here. So that tells me the max month of my order date. Um, but what I need to be able to do then is um, I want to be able to kind of pad that, let's say, by maybe three months or something like that. So I'm going to use the date add function. And my date part is going to be a uh, month. Oops. And I messed this one up live, Dirk, so hopefully I don't mess it up this time. And then my interval is going to be, let's say I want to add six months, and then there's my date field. And close that off. So now I have uh, my nice little date add. Hit OK. And I now have this field called max month. So I'm going to drag that onto my, right click and drag that onto my detail shelf and choose my continuous months. And when I hover over, you'll see my max month uh, doesn't change. It's always June of 2016, even though the end point is December of 2015. Great. So now if I go into my analytics pane, I can drag on a reference line on the month, and I should be able to choose my max month. And then what I like to do here is I like to show no labels and turn off the recalculate and make sure that your line is set to none as well. So now there's this line over here, but nobody can see it, and it gives me a nice little buffer on the end to give me spacing. So I really like using reference lines for that. But this way is more dynamic because of the calculation that I've created for the max month. So again, it's just using this level of detail expression that's saying, um, basically, look at the entire data set and bring back the maximum month. OK. All right, so let's say that somebody um, sends you a visual like this, Dirk, and uh, you need to know how to rebuild it. So what's the best way to know what columns, what's on the columns and what's on the rows and what are the calculations, right? So we see we've got some kind of table calc on here, but I can't be bothered to look at that window. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to the worksheet menu, 
and I'm going to choose Describe Sheet. So now what you can see here is it tells you exactly how the sheet was built. So it tells you there's a mark type of circle, um, stack marks are turned off, uh, this is what's on your shelves, you've got the, the, the median and the moving average of the median, what's on your columns, what's on your color, and then it also tells you how the, um, um, how the table calc is calculated. So it says the window uses the 19 previous values and the current value is included. So it looks like it's a 20 month moving average. So a really quick way to see how to rebuild a sheet. All right. So uh, this is another tip from Andre from, from Germany. And basically I know that all of my teal worksheets, all the ones that have this teal color at the bottom, uh, I need to apply a filter to all of those. So I'm gonna just drag this, I have a set here that just uh, limits the data set to 1960 and above. And what I wanna do is I wanna be able to apply that filter to just my sheets that are teal. Well, that could be a real pain if you have a ton of sheets to figure out which ones to do. So um, if I go down to apply worksheets and do selected worksheets, notice how the sheets are actually color coded in here. So if I scroll down, I've got all these different color coded sheets. So you can use the color coding then to just apply it to the teal colored sheets. Hit OK. And now when I go back, you'll see that that filter is now applied here. And I think I have some near the beginning, right? So I've got, you know, you'll see I've got fewer and fewer as I go across. Okay, I broke my, date, my make date calculation, but, uh, and here's one more. So that's a quick way to go ahead and apply a um, uh, filter to just the colored tabs. All right, so the next tip here is, uh, so Pooja Gandhi in the US, she works for Comcast. She always does these beautiful visualizations and she likes to use kind of these text boxes to sort of draw uh, pictures, right, and and um, kind of set some framing. So how does she actually do that? Well, I'm going to start by, again, I'm doing floating, and I'm just going to go ahead and drag a text box on here, and I'm just going to hit OK. All right, so I've got this kind of blank text box. Let me make it a bit bigger. And if I format this text box, I can turn on a border. So let me make it like a thick black border just to make it easy to see. So we've got something like that. So now if I want to if I want to do something kind of like she has here where she kind of breaks the lines, I'm just going to take another text box and drag it in here. And I'm going to say, uh, this is how you split the box. And maybe make this a nice big font and hit OK. So now I've got this here. And if I make this a little bit bigger and see how I'm stretching it just past the edges of the box behind it. So something like that. And now on this box, what I want to do is format it and just set the shading to white. And there we go. We now have a nice little box that looks like um, it was done in PowerPoint or something like that. Very, very neat. All right. So divider. Lovely. Lines. Yeah, I like that one. <laughs> Andy. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, we are, well, about to uh, end the session. Uh, mm -hmm. because we're reaching uh, 10 a.m. your time, 11 a.m. Okay. CET. Um, and I think it was, you know, I, I counted over 50 tips, not okay. 20, <laughs> right? Yeah. Maybe even 55. So so a great job. Well, thank okay. you very, very much sure. for, for sharing uh, your knowledge and also the, the tip of others like, like the data schoolers. Yeah. Uh, as mentioned, uh, Andy is running the data school and we are always looking for great talent. You are always welcome to apply uh, on the website, have a chat with Andy, uh, send a tweet or whatever. Um, so uh, yeah, looking forward to applications. Yeah. We are looking forward to further questions in regards to what has been shared today. We are going to share this recording. Yeah, maybe in a couple of days time, we might do a bit of tweaking here and there. Uh, hopefully uh, not much work to do, uh, but we will share it. Yeah, uh, one question, Andy, are you going to share the, the workbook as well? I th I think yes, so I will, right. yep. Okay, perfect. And so, uh, Dirk, maybe what we could do is maybe after, um, so we, ha we have Craig and Chris lined up coming up, right? Um, so maybe yeah. after maybe after those two, I could come back and finish up with the tips I didn't get to. We'll do a bonus session. Yeah, I'm up for that. 
Okay. And I guess the attendees are up for that as well, uh, because I think this was great. And uh, thank you very, very much, Andy, for, for this. You were mentioning the upcoming two uh, webinars with Craig Bloodworth and Chris Love. Uh, we will also share the links for the sign up uh, in our follow up email to all uh, signed up people. Um, yeah, uh, there are a couple of events uh, upcoming actually this week. Um, Andy will be in Germany on Thursday for the Tableau User Group uh, in Munich, but that's already full, this event. <coughs> Sorry. And on Friday, Andy will be in Milan for a Tableau Zen Master Day. Yes, sir. And then, I think Sounds this good. next week, I think next week uh, there's going to be uh, an event um, in, uh, in London. Is it next week, the cinema event? Uh, yeah, nice. so next week the Information Lab is hosting an event um, to showcase all of the new features in Tableau 10. So if you're in London, um, if you go to the, uh, the Information Lab's website, I believe there's an event on there. So let me bring up the informationlab.co.uk. And if I go down to the events page, um, hopefully it's on there. Yeah, what's new with Tableau? So you can just go on here and you can register for that event. Very, very simple. Perfect. Really good. And our friends and colleagues uh, in the other countries like France or Netherlands, they have events lined up uh, all through the year, like Tableau workshops, uh, uh, Tableau best practices sessions, etc. PP. So have a look on their websites uh, on the event section to mm -hmm. see if there is uh, an event uh, of interest for you. Um, yeah, looking forward to meet you in person there. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much uh, for being our guest today. And uh, looking forward, yeah, thank you, Andy. Uh, looking forward to see you on the 10th of November, uh, the second part of the Tableau Zen Master webinar series from the Information Lab with Chris Love. Topic, Tableau Advanced Visualization with Unions. I will share the sign-up links on that as well. Yep, and I also have the page, I also have the page up right now, Dirk, on the German website. Yep. So, yep. Uh, from any of the information lab pages, you can click at the little link at the top, and it'll take you to the uh, appropriate. Uh, so, if you pick the information lab Germany, and then go to the events page, you'll see all three of the events here with links to register for those. Perfect. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day, uh, and see you soon. Bye-bye. Right, thank you, Dirk. Bye.